Kiedis wakes up and sees the carnage that Sin has left behind once again. As he checks the scene for survivors, Sin retreats back into the ocean, and Tidus, having had just about enough of this Spira place, storms off after him. Don't you run away from me! Getting close to Sin again gives Tidus a strange vision, one in which he sees that little boy with the hood again, and reminisces on his past in Xanarkin with Jack. He inexplicably winds up back on the shore, and notices Yuna performing another sending for the dozens of lives that were snuffed out by Sin. Orin has a standoff with Keenok, where he insinuates that this was intentional, to kill off heathens who use Machina. His response is as pragmatic and helpful as you'd expect. The past ten years have changed you, I see. Seymour creeps on Yuna for a little bit while Titus has a talk with Orin. He explains to Titus that Sin didn't come here after the Sin spawn. He came looking for Titus. Orin posits that Jekt wants to be killed to stop himself from taking any more lives. Titus is clearly skeptical of this explanation, and because he hasn't gotten the fucking memo yet, once again insists that Orin is lying to him, prompting him to simply walk away and join the others. They still have a pilgrimage to complete, after all. The Jose Temple is nearby, but another summoner is already inside. A guy named Isaru and his guardians are exiting, just as Yuna and the others enter. He spends a few minutes jerking off how great Lord Brasco was, and generally being a bit of a weirdo, but he's voiced by Quentin Flynn, so he gets a pass. You have the look of your father. Before taking off, he warns the crew that a high number of summoners have been disappearing lately, and nobody has figured out the cause. Inside the Cloister of Trials, I begin to seriously contemplate all of my life choices that led me to this point. The Jose Temple is the worst trial in the game for one simple reason. It is a puzzle dungeon with no actual solvable puzzle. Allow me to elaborate. The first part of this test is straightforward. You move some pillars around, relocate some orbs. So far, so good. You'll get this door open, and realize it leads to a sea of lightning that you have no way to cross. You can spend as long as you want rearranging orbs, moving the pillars around, trying every combination you can think of, but you'll never create a path across the lightning. This is the only solution in the entire game I had to look up a guide for. The way to progress is to shove one of the pedestals off into the lightning pit, at which point it starts floating. How and why? There is no point after or prior to this moment where the pillars are used like this, and there's no indication that this is an ability that they possess. This is most definitely one of those try everything with everything till something happens bullshit 90s adventure game puzzles, and I do not vibe with that nonsense. It's not a trial that you can solve with clues or critical thinking, it's crap. Though on the bright side, I can say this was the only cloister that's objectively poorly designed. All the other ones are pretty much fine. Yuna goes to the Faith to pray, and we gotta wait out here for her to finish. Stop pacing around, be calm and wait. <sighs> Quite the show, yeah? Not so good on the heart, though. You should try to settle down. Yuna will be blamed if anything happens. Alright, I'll get to the point. For whatever reason, the next cutscene only triggers if you try to leave. I don't know if this is a mistake or not. Keep this in mind, because the same situation will repeat itself later. To get to the next temple, our lot of crusaders have to cross the Moonflow, a large river that's name makes absolutely no sense in the English version of the script. In the Japanese version, the river is called the Pyre Stream, named after the Pyreflies, which are those glowing rainbow spirit things we've been seeing throughout the game. I don't have a problem with any other translations in the games, but why would they remove a reference on purpose to another aspect of the world and replace it with a generic name like Moonflow? The other thing I want to bitch about in this area is Ochu. Ochu is a type of monster that was clearly designed by someone who was having a shitty day at the office and just wanted to piss people off. It has an attack called Ochu Dance that does what can be politely and elegantly described as violently shitting out every status ailment at once. When used, it has the chance to inflict every party member with dark, confuse, poison, slow, and silence. Yes, I said and, not or which means you could potentially end up with many of these at once, on everyone. Do not worry though, this game's hard-on for debuffs and status effects is only beginning. This is the Moonflow. These are Moon Lilies. They say that clouds of fireflies gather here when night falls. 
The entire river glows like a sea of stars. Really? Hey, I got an idea! We're not waiting till nightfall. Ah. Uh. No. Then, once we beat Sin, we're coming back. All of the sudden, everyone gets very awkward and quiet. Come to think of it, this happens whenever Titus mentions what life will be like after Yuna beats Sin. There's certainly something they're not telling us. Mysterious future plot revelations aside, it's time to ride this big elephant anteater abomination to the other side of the river. To my great surprise, this game released all the way back in 2001 starts having an interesting conversation about the hypocrisy of religion. Yeah, we're going there, I guess. A sunken city. A machina city, a thousand years old. They built the city on top of bridges across a river. But the weight of the city caused the bridges to collapse, and it all sank to the bottom. Right, it's a good lesson. A lesson? Yeah. Why build a city over a river, yeah? Uh, well, it would be convenient with all that water there. Nope, that's not why. They just wanted to prove they could defy the laws of nature. Hmm? I'm not so sure about that. Yevon has taught us. When humans have power, they seek to use it. If you don't stop them, they go too far, yeah? Yeah, but don't you use Machina too? Like the stadium and stuff, right? Yevon, it decides which Machina we may use and which we may not. So what kind of Machina may we not use then? Remember Operation Meehan? That kind. Ugh. What could that be? Sit down. Sorry! Ah! The Abed! Wow, that was somehow even less believable than her being kidnapped while standing next to us in a bar. As has been established, only Waka and Titus can fight underwater, so it's up to them to rescue Yuna. During this battle is the first time I became aware of the ability to switch weapons mid-battle. Why would you need a feature like this? It's actually pretty interesting. That no intermission this time, it won't take that long. I'm going to say something that will be incredibly confusing to you if you've never played this game before, but stick with me here. Weapons in Final Fantasy X do not have stats. Neither does armor. The value of a weapon is in its abilities. Each piece of equipment has a set number of slots, between 1 and 4. Each of these slots can be filled with an ability when you pick the weapon up, or can have abilities manually inserted into them after a certain point in the story has passed. Abilities range from percentage-based stat boosts, to elemental affinities, to status effect annulments. This means that certain weapons and armor might be useful for one fight, but be completely pointless in another. Case in point, this boss right here. The weapons I had equipped were normal, so I switched both of them over to lightning-charged weapons I had picked up to do extra damage. Not that it's really required here, this is another Titus and Waka exclusive fight, so strategy and planning aren't really an option. Buff yourself one or two times with cheer and you'll be good. Back in the cab, we're reminded of something that I haven't really acknowledged yet. Damn the outbid! What do they want from us? Could it have something to do with Luca? What are they after Yuna for? Wait, they're mad they lost the tournament. Oh wait, they're mad about Operation Meehan. I wonder, didn't Kamari's clansmen say something about summoners disappearing? Ah, so the Albeda behind that? Those Sam Plastic Grease Monkeys. Waka is super fucking racist. Like, really bad? Like, an honestly kind of uncomfortable degree. Now, Considering he's a protagonist, we all know he'll change his mind eventually, but for the time being, I won't lie and say it doesn't sour my opinion on his character for a decent chunk of the game. To be fair to the game though, it's pretty clearly presented that Waka is in the wrong when he acts this way, so it's not like it's offensive or anything. Done for 
more back there. While waiting for the others to finish their business at the dock, Titus just so happens to meet up with Riku, whose face is really off-looking in the FMVs, and I hope it's not just me who thinks that. How did she get here? Well, Riku was piloting the Machina that kidnapped Yuna in the Moonflow. This is certainly going to require an explanation. W wait but you attacked us! Nuh-uh. It's not exactly what you think. Yo! Friend of yours. Uh, and you could say that. Yuna, Lulu, I told you about her, remember? She was the one who helped me before I was washed up on Besaid. She's an Albed. <laughs> wow, so you like all your life. What luck meeting here, yeah? Praise be to Yevon. So, uh, Riku, you look a little beat up. You okay? Uh, Waka. Huh? What? There's something we need to discuss. Oh, go ahead. Girls only. Boys, please wait over there. Right. Sorry, Waka. Huh? What? Ah. After a short discussion that the player can't hear, and that as far as I can remember is never revealed, Yuna asks if Riku can be a guardian as well. After their foregone conclusion, they decide in private that it's for the best to keep Riku's heritage a secret from Waka, what with him being a religious spazoid and all. With Riku by our side, our world-saving party is now complete. I explained Riku's use ability earlier, but now we can select her secondary ability that works hand in hand with use, that being Steal. Stealing can be used on an enemy once every encounter to receive a wide variety of usable items. The game will randomly select between a regular drop or a rare drop based on predetermined odds. Which two items can be stolen are dependent on the fiend you're trying to rob. Bear in mind that low level Machina cannot be stolen from and will instead fall apart and drop Albed potions if you attempt to. Riku's overdrive is Mix, and it's both the most powerful overdrive and the most beyond infuriating one to use, because it relies completely upon trial and error. Mixing combines two different items to create a brand new effect. This effect is not recorded, and you're given no indication of what effect you're about to invoke. It could be a damaging item of various elements, a stat buffing item, a healing item, and I think you can see why this thing can be a nightmare to deal with. That makes this a good old fashioned bust out the paper and pencil and fold it up inside the game box style note taking situation. It's not an impossible to learn skill, it just takes a while till you get a handle of a couple useful mixes and what kind of items mix to form what. That being said, I still never used it. We're like over an hour into these videos and I'm all out of unique scene transitions that aren't just me saying blank arrives at blank. So I'm just gonna say the characters are in Guado Salon now. This is a cavern based town that Maester Seymour is the leader of. Oh joy. Of course, Seymour wants to meet with Yuna, while the rest of the group is distrusting of the situation. Guado Salam doesn't even have a temple, there's no reason to be here. Because, who cares, Seymour takes Yuna and the others to a special room that holographically recreates the original, pristine version of Xanarkin, using the memories of the Pyreflies. No, I don't know how he does this, it comes out of nowhere, don't ask me. As we fly along the night sky, it's impossible to not notice that this place looks exactly like the Xanarkin that Titus is from. At the end of this magical mystery tour, we're shown a projection of Lady Unaleska, the first person to defeat Sin. The story goes that only through a powerful bond of love was she capable of striking the monster down. Do you... Do you have, like, some more details? I, I can't swing the power of friendship at a giant whale demon. I, I don't think that's gonna cut it. Your face is beat red. You okay? He... He asked me to marry him. You serious? Uh, hey! As one would imagine, Titus and the gang aren't so hot on this plan. Though I'm sure his reasons are a little different than the rest. Why are you still here, sir? I beg your pardon. 
We Guado are keen to the scent of the far plain. Before Orin has a chance to finish considering the question, Yuna decides to go for a visit to the far plain, where she can consult with her father. You know, the dead one. Titus is just as confused as the player at this point, and decides it's best if he just sees it for himself. Orin chooses to stay outside, stating that he doesn't belong there. Whatever that means. The Far Plane, to me, is one of the most interesting pieces of lore in the entirety of Final Fantasy X. The Far Plane is the afterlife for the people of Spira, and it would appear to be the only one, as no morality is ever assigned to it like heaven or hell. Though usually on separate planes of existence, there is a small area in Guado Salam where the Far Plane intersects with the real world. Here, the living can enter and call upon the spirits of the people they've lost. The specifics of this are a little strange, and might be a little janky from early 2000s translation issues, though I can't be sure. It's explained that what you see in the Far Plane isn't the true soul of the person you're speaking to. It is a motionless, voiceless illusion conjured by the Pyreflies based on your memories of the person in question. However, that person will only appear if they are in fact dead and have been sent to the Far Plane. Why? If it isn't really the soul of the person you're summoning, then why does it matter if they're dead or not? Furthermore, and perhaps I should have asked this question first, why do people come here? This isn't some metaphorical spiritual thing. Characters like Yuna and Waka act as though there is a genuine, tangible benefit to speaking with the illusions, and that they'll somehow be granted advice or guidance of some kind. Maybe it's because I'm not very much a religious person, but it seems odd to me the perceived importance of talking to what is described to ostensibly be a mannequin that doesn't even talk. Specifics aside, we can listen in on Waka talking to Chapu about what's happened on his journey, while Lulu adamantly refuses to even approach him. So, how you been? Oh, that guy I just told you about? I gave him your sword. He likes it. Huh? Wow. He is dead, and I am still alive. Coming here really makes that clear. I should focus more on what I have to do now. <laughs> what, what? I'm not even sure what I'm saying. Don't you mean that you should leave Chapu behind? I'm sure he was a great guy, but there'll be others. Hmm, that's a possibility. Hmm, how about mm, Waka? What, me with Waka? Yeah, you two get along great. Getting along isn't enough. Not even close. Oh, sorry. My mistake. You'd do well to remember that. Knowing a bit about women might come in handy someday. Yeah, I'll remember. I won't be forgetting either. Goodbye, Chapu. You always said I looked grumpy. But those were the happiest days of my life. Hey, so see that little spark there? As far as I can gather, there's no message or notification that tells you this, but Brotherhood is now upgraded after watching this scene. It gains a few more abilities, like Strength Ups, that make it Titus' best weapon in the game, aside from his Ultima weapon. After Yuna has finished up talking to her parents, she turns to Titus and asks if he'd like to try and summon Jack. Titus is hesitant. He knows this won't work, of course, as only he and Orin know, Jack is sin. While he mulls the idea around in his head, Titus is suddenly greeted with an apparition of his mother. She has no name, by the way, she's only ever listed as Titus' mother. He's taken aback at first. The people of Xanarkin didn't even know what Ascending was. How could his mother's soul have ended up in the Far Plane? Yuna tells him that if you accept your death when it comes, you don't need to be sent to pass on to the Far Plane. This revelation triggers something in the back of Titus' memories. I think I just... figured something out. What? Why I hate my old man. See, so, so I, told I told him what I thought of him right, right there. What? Really? Of course. <laughs> I suppose, but... Mommy! Just a sec, dear. Whenever my old man was around, my mother wouldn't even look at me. Maybe that's when I started to resent him, even hate him. When he left us, Mom just lost her energy. Is she alright? Why should you care? If she dies, 
I wouldn't know what to do. Don't say mom is gonna die. I apologize. The old lady next door told me, when a lovebird dies, the one left behind, it just gives up living so it can join its mate. It was just like that. I hated my old man even more. But really, my old man... Mommy! Just a sec, dear. Ah, uh, go to him. You'll cry if you don't. Maybe Jekt wasn't as terrible of a father as Titus thought he was. As the Guardians leave the far plane, something bizarre starts happening. Lord Jiskel! Oh, Lord Jiskel! Uh, he does not belong here. Why? Yuna, send him. Jiskel. He is Lord Jiskel no more. Send him now. <laughs> Not only does his attempt to escape the far plane mean Lord Jiskel wasn't accepting of death before he passed, it also means he wasn't sent correctly. Wonder who was supposed to be responsible for that. Yuna returns to answer Seymour's proposal, but he isn't here. He's left for the temple in Makalania. Oh, so sad. Sorry to have missed him. Guess we'll just have to move on to the next faith. It isn't too far away, but to get there, we'll have to cross the Thunder Plains. We head north. Not too near and not too far from the towers, yeah? Meaning we should avoid wide open areas. I think I forgot something in Guado Salam. Nice knowing you. Okay, okay, I'll go. What is that music? Is this the Thunder Plains or Silent Fucking Hill? This area's terrifying soundtrack is either intentionally or unintentionally appropriate, though. The Thunder Plains is a region of much pain and suffering, especially for completionists. The gimmick to the Thunder Plains is that lightning strikes down on your location at random intervals. To avoid being fried, you have to press X the instant before you're hit. Your indicator for this timing is a white flash that happens just a fraction of a second before the strike. It's even a little harder than it sounds like it is, but there's no real penalty for missing, so you could practice all you like. And practice you should. Because in keeping in line with every other minigame in Final Fantasy X, there's a challenge here, and it's tedious and unbearable. You can unlock a series of reward items for dodging the lightning particular numbers of times in a row. This doesn't seem like too bad of an idea. How many you need to dodge? Like, 20? 30? 300. To get every prize for lightning dodges, you need to dodge 300 bolts consecutively. That's like 20 minutes of walking in a circle and reacting to a randomly timed event in less than a second without making one mistake. I did not get all the rewards for lightning dodging. Yuna and the others stop to rest at an inn, and she immediately heads to her room, which everyone points out is very unlike her. Titus eavesdrops to see if she's alright, and figures out that the item Jiskel dropped back at the far plane was a message sphere, asking for Yuna to take care of his son Seymour. Alas, Yuna runs off before we can get an explanation of the rest of the message, so we're only left with this vague snippet. As they prepare to move on the next day, Yuna stops everyone because she has something important she needs to discuss with them. I've... decided to marry. I thought so. But... but why? Why'd you change your mind? For Spira's future, and Yevon's unity. I thought it would be the best thing to do. That's not good enough. Wait, is it? Is it because of Lord Jiskel? Hey, that's fear! Show me. I can't. I must speak to Maester Seymour first. I truly am sorry, but this is... 
It is a personal matter. You're kidding, huh? As you wish. I'm sorry. Just one thing. Uh, I won't quit my pilgrimage. Then it is fine. Wait a minute, Oren. You don't care? I mean, you're not gonna stop her? No, I'm not. As long as she is willing to face sin, all else is her concern. That is a summoner's privilege, as long as she journeys. But that's... Yeah. As they enter a nearby forest, Orin and Titus hypothesize that the reason Yuna is being so awkward and conflicted about marrying Seymour is because she's planning something. They have no idea what. Because it seems like everybody has to stop and pull us aside today, Orin has the group all come down a small path to see something that he claims is very important. This place... It's just water, isn't it? This is what spheres are made of. It absorbs and preserves people's memories. What's that? Fiends are also attracted to these places. I somehow get the feeling that's not what he's talking about. This weird sphere thing falls in the unfortunate category of being far too easy, but also unbelievably annoying to face. The trick to this boss is that it will constantly switch its elemental affinity, which on paper sounds like an interesting idea for a boss fight, if it wasn't for the fact that, as far as I can tell, there isn't any method to determine which element it has currently switched to, other than attacking it with a low-level spell of an element and seeing whether it resists it or not. There's probably some sort of weird tell that I'm not noticing. I mean, there has to be. There's no way the boss is just this poorly designed. Because in its current state, you just have to slowly whittle down its health while accidentally healing it on occasion. When defeated, it leaves behind the item that Orin was talking about, a message sphere left behind by Jeff, detailing various seemingly inconsequential moments during his, Orin, and Braska's pilgrimage. Inconsequential, that is, until we get to the last recording. Hey, if you're sitting there watching this, it means you are stuck in Spira like me. You might not know when you'll get back home. But you better not be crying. Although I guess I'd understand. But you know what? There's a time when you have to stop crying and move on. You'll be fine. Remember, you're my son. And, well, uh, never mind, I'm no good at these things. Anyways, I believe in you. Be good. Goodbye. He sounded almost serious, but it was too late. He was serious. Jacked had already accepted his fate. His fate? Jacked, he. He was always talking about going home to Xanarkin. That's why he took all those pictures, to show them to you when he returned. But as he journeyed with us, and came to understand Spira and Braska's resolve, it happened gradually, but Jekt changed. He decided he would join Braska in his fight against Sin. So then, he gave up going home? That was his decision. I guess I understood. My old man, he knew there was no way back home, back to Xanarkand. He wanted to go home, but he knew he couldn't. He couldn't go on until he accepted it. Besides, even if he had found a way back, I don't think he would have left his friends behind before their journey was complete. All right. 
Let's go, guys. Maybe I had to start accepting my own fate. Wait. Yeah? Jekt loved you. Oh, come on, please. He just didn't know how to express it, he said. Enough about my old man, okay? I just thought you should know. Okay. Thanks.